striving to be a podcast that vibes this replacement level morality. My name is Joseph. And I'm Andrew. Do you like to subsist on your vibes, Andrew? Uh, I do not subsist on vibes, but since since the polls are broken, that's all we have. And they <laughs> have to be good enough. <laughs> so I guess this qualifies as our election preview question mark. Yeah, no question mark. We are we are doing an election preview episode. Quite pretentious of a, a show that is uh, barely a blip on anyone's radar. But you know what? I love to talk about election politics. So by God, I'm going to take this opportunity to do so. Where do you want to go with this, though? So I want to go through, just take a high level approach to why, why we think the polls are broken fundamentally not meaningful this cycle why this is a vibes election to uh credit a phrase from the artist formerly known as all upon it uh, <laughs> and then what we think those vibes are go through not race by race but uh, what we think is going to happen why we think that's going to happen and what that means I think that calling this a vibes election is nearly as good as your reveal preference or GTFO. Uh, but it's it, yours is still better in terms of a, <laughs> a phrase to describe one's world. But uh, this calling this a vibes election. Ooh, that just feels right. Spiritually. It has itself a vibe. I it guess definitely has say. a vibe. Yeah. And it has a vibe that has changed dramatically in the last six months. Yeah, so I guess we should start with the whole polling is broken and yeah. really you know, maybe take apart exactly why that seems to, like so fundamentally the case now. Yeah, so uh, the first thing to note is they've been wrong two elections in a row, pretty systemically biased. I think uh, you can make a pretty clear case that blue collar, lower class workers are being undercounted, undercounted pretty dramatically the the people who pick up the phone and talk to a pollster are people like myself and joseph yes. and not people who uh work in a factory and just show up to vote on on polling day and don't really engage with politics outside of that we call them we call them the normies yes. affectionately the normies are great and your data your data point that's most correlated with that is response rates are a third of what they used to be a third. So I'm surprised they're that high. So when, when pollsters are calling to try and collect opinions, they are getting a response a third as often as they used to, to engage with the poll because no one wants to talk to pollsters. And as you mentioned, this is going to cause people who are politically engaged to over represent in the sample. And you can do all the math in the world to try and, play with that number based on your set of assumptions about the electorate. But I I'm sure to your hard statistical brain, that sounds like the worst kind of data science <laughs> or not yes. even really data science. It is it's vibes. It's I, I don't, I have a reliable set of data anymore. So I'm going to do voodoo magic to it and change the numbers arbitrarily based on the way I think the world works. Hey, Joseph. Yes. How do you know that macroeconomists have a sense of humor? I don't know. How? They use decimal points. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is a great joke. And that's the exact feeling you get from these polls is we're trying to create this pretense of scientific achievement yes. by artificially increasing the sample of this group but you know no group is a monolith so even among whatever group you're trying to overrepresent to compensate for the things you're compensating for you're still going to get a sample of people who are a little bit crazy because they picked up the phone from an unknown number and wanted to talk to a random person about politics yeah you're like in that who you're you're not going to get normal people doing that anymore you're going yeah. to get a lot more elite people doing that. And I don't need a poll to tell me that the elite populations of certain places are very split right now. <laughs> you know, 
like that. I don't need a poll to tell me that 50% of the people who would pick up the phone to talk in Nevada are going to be for our team R and the other 50% are going to be for team D, you know? Right. I, I can observe the world around me. That was obvious. <laughs> and so you're with, if you're measuring tool for collecting this opinion, that was reliable because politics was treated as something normal rather than creedal. You are only left with these more base level assumptions about how people work and what they care about to tell you the story of what you expect to happen. Then that's where you get to vibes, right? Which is, well, if all of my food costs more and my gas is more and everything just feels shitty and I'm going to go vote, I'm going to vote against whoever I can determine is responsible for this shittiness and someone else who might be promising to make it better. Right. And if you're not, you're not engaged enough to know like more than the filibuster exists, you're like, Oh, there is a democratic president. That's mostly what you know. And I'm going to vote for something, not that. And uh, I believe you, you, you said this very eloquently earlier today, but in the 2020 election, Voters were very clear that uh, about two things. One, they did not like Donald Trump. And two, they did not like democratic policies. And from the perspective of someone who's not very online, only one of those things is on the ballot this time. And that's, that's the vibes of the vibes are bad. And therefore this election will be bad for Democrats. There has been a lot of ink spilled about how deep the wounds could run. There's been a lot of chatter. Could Lee Zeldin wind up governor of New York? You know, what what kind of trouble could deep blue areas like Oregon or Los Angeles? Could be real changes. Uh, Vermont, uh, the incumbent Democrat in Vermont, uh, 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 New Hampshire, Vermont. Which is it? you're you're thinking New Hampshire? Okay, sorry. Uh, the incumbent Democrat in New Hampshire just cut an ad that her closing argument is she's going to stand up against Joe Biden. Now, note she has voted with Joe Biden ninety nine point six percent of the time so far, but she has criticized him for his handling of Afghanistan and is hoping that that gives her over the gets her over the hump in a relatively blue state in a statewide election. Yep. But, Wow, th- there are there are enough polls to show the Democrats are in trouble, uh, and we just we just went on about they're broken. But that there are internal polls that are not being released to counteract the narrative, and we're just seeing uh, elements of vibes, seeing reports of lots of not Kathy Hochul signs up in New York which is not expected for New York. Like she's probably going to win, but the the reports, the vibes are that uh the down ballot races from Kathy Hochul from the governor's seat are really worried about her dragging their numbers down specifically. Yeah, I mean the the real impact of this isn't necessarily that Lee Zeldin becomes governor of New York. I mean that would be a 30 point swing. I don't necessarily think that's possible, even in this circumstance, as we're just not in that era. But even if it becomes a five point race that has serious impacts on congressional races yep. and places that went from, you know, medium blue to light red to make that kind of swing happen. And this costs you seats. I think actually the GOP has some problems that aren't really in the news. First is California. The House redistricting in California was very aggressive to try and wipe out the rest of the Republicans that are in the state because the state does have a strong rural core in the valley. And it's always there's always been a breed of suburban and and rural Republicans within California that have always been a minority, but they've always been there and they've always been unable to get removed. And they've tried this time around with the redistrict to eliminate most 
of the rest of the Republicans that have represent the state. Right. The state's and, huge. Like there are probably more Republicans in California than there are in Ohio. It's just California is huge. Exactly. There's, there's a lot of rural parts that still got congressional seats. And if they don't, that could be a problem as far as House taking control. And I really do think that the exodus of California has been primarily from the Republicans in the state. Like these districts that contain these red populations are the ones that bounced over the last two years because they just, they're, it's a rich state. They're economically mobile. They're already in the, the rural to suburban parts. So they have the option to leave unlike most people, you know? Right. And that combined with an aggressive will make it just slightly blue to try and finally fucking force these people out. Uh, gerrymander, I think might spell a kind of blunting of an otherwise really big night for them in the house. You know, I could sure. see them getting into the West coast 20 seats, you know, ahead and like, Oh man, once these come in, what's going to be like a 35, 40 seat majority. And then California just runs up, runs the other way. Because yeah. that's where Team Blue is the strongest, and they're going to turn out no matter what, just because politics is a way of life there. And that's enough to force out five or six Republicans that otherwise would have won under any other circumstance. I, I don't think that's really been picked up in the media much. And then the second item I wanted to bring up was Michigan. I did not know, and I think this might matter only in Michigan because of this, they are the only state this year in the fall that has an abortion measure statewide. Oh, really? Yes. So the, we, there was one in Kansas at a special election. You know, there's been like little drips and drabs here and there, but Michigan is the only state where there is a constitutional amendment that would legalize officially your right to have an abortion up to the point of fetal viability at a minimum. And everything else could be legislated for the state of Michigan. And I'm curious. Well, I know for certain that Gretchen Whitmer's, a result will be closely tied to whatever happens to that. There'll be right. a strong correlation between the two of those. I think I honestly think that this, this constitutional amendment might do a little better than oh, Gretchen for sure. Whitmer. And that I, is, why, I think that's not close. And I do think that matters because it's going to motivate people to go out to vote that are going to check, check to approve that who are then going to maybe decide to check the box for, for uh, Gretchen Whitmer despite the fact that she was a COVID like, and then this will also kind of show how much did all the maximal COVID stuff actually matter two and a half years later, Gretchen Whitmer wouldn't let you buy seeds, you know, like did a bunch of dumb shit, did the dumbest shit possible. And then got caught like going to their houseboat, right? Like if this right. COVID stuff mismanagement matters, it would matter in this case. So does it, you know? Yeah. And in, in this purplish state where I think specifically we're seeing the, working class voter shift red in a way that you know, I, I, I think it's really glossed over that blue uh, that Michigan was so blue for so long until Trump won it in 2016. And it's such a reflection of that working class shift to someone is finally talking about my problems in a, in a way that Democrats just haven't really spoken to. I really think that the non-ideological black and Latino voters will be the fulcrum that the election turns around where yeah. the people who want more police in their area by polling, who think crime is a serious issue and inflation is a serious issue because they're not rich enough for inflation to not be a serious issue to them. Those are the people who normally would vote blue and will stay home or will continue their gradual transition to the Republican party. I think you're absolutely correct. I think that it's, it's, but like you said, it's both people have been focusing a lot on the Hispanic vote and it's slow migration to the right as time goes on. But I think the bigger story this year could very well be a massive growth within African Americans for the GOP it's precisely for the reason you, you mentioned, because crime has become a key issue and the left has so alienated itself 
to people who actually live in high crime areas and are politically engaged that yeah. they could just act. They could see a huge growth with people who are like, you want order and I want order for you too. Yep. Come, I mean, I, I know that we may not get along for long, but we can get along right now. Right now you want police and I want to give them to you. So let's do this. <laughs> right. And it doesn't even have to be, you want police and I want to give them to you. So you pull the lever. It could be just, I don't want to pull the lever for Democrats because I know that they're, it's culturally taboo to discuss crime as a problem. You know, Kathy Hochul saying, why do you care about crime? <laughs> Oof. Oof. Like just oh. vibes. Oof. That's the like, vibe of that statement. That, that was the, that, that could very well end up being the parents shouldn't have a say in their kids' education moment of this election. Yeah. Because that was the moment when Terry McAuliffe, flushed his ability to become governor down the toilet. Yeah. It was, it was that moment crystallized into the media and shown and, and you can start to see it uh, you know, in terms of the vibes as well as the polls. And again, we're referencing polls a lot for something that we think is broken. I don't think that polls are useless because you can get a sense of elite thought and if elite thought is tanking, that tells you a lot. Right. If elite thought is showing a very clear trend, that's probably reliable. Like, I think DeSantis is going to be Chris, right? Like, and it's not just vibes that tell me that. It's that they, the elites in Florida know that, right? Like, everyone's right. feeling that. Polls are useless as an exaggeration, just because polls, even if they are fundamentally broken, they aren't more fundamentally broken than they were six months ago. So to the extent that they have shifted from six months ago, that's significant. It's just instead of looking at the number, you look at the delta from previous trend. Yeah. What what is the change been? Yeah. And that tells you about the the where sentiment is headed. Direction, speed, acc- acceleration. These things do actually matter, and you can get that from a poll, even if it tells, the number is arbitrary. It tells you that Charlie Crist is going to lose. Yes. <laughs> It does. And, and and apocalyptically so. Ron DeSantis is a political genius. He has turned Florida from a purple state into a red state in four years. Yeah. Like, unquestioningly. Culturally a red state. Like, blue voters are, are, are red voters there, you know? Because they yeah. embrace it as a culture. And, and in Florida specifically is where you get the breakdown of latino as a construct because cubans are specifically so much different from you know mexicans or or any other latin american origin person yeah they're rich <laughs> they're it's rich and they, hate, and they hate communism yeah like the there's a key the key difference of why cubans are much different is they they are they have money cuban exiles were the were the capitalists this is yeah. forgotten Right. This is forgotten in time. But the Cubans that came here, they were the ones that were fleeing the communists because they had all of the money. <laughs> so when they arrived here, they built for themselves quite a bit of cachet very quickly because of that. I don't think that could be underrated for a sympathy towards the GOP, the the capitalists of the political class. But before Florida was a swing state, it was a solid democratic state. So even there with the trends, you can see the the shift towards Republicans in a way that kind of defies – it lines up with class, but it defies race, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, and class, I think, is going to become a more important element of study in politics in the f- next 10 years. I think that when this election shows a big shift, which I think it will, of minority populations towards the GOP, that smart the smart political minds are going to be dissecting class and what class means. Because class is not income either. Right. And so the class has always been equal to income in the past. Now there's going to be work to separate income from class and use class as – how you can better determine voting trends. 
If I were a man yes. who had a consulting Plumbers company, make a lot more money than the media and journalists, but journalists are much higher class. Exactly. That's, that's never been so salient, I don't think. And if if I were someone who owned a consulting company in DC, circle it exclamation point, put an underline under it. This is what you have to unpack if you are going to make polling and political strategy work in the future. Is you must understand what class actually is. And how to cater to it for you for your policy prescriptions. Yep. I don't think that they've on the, the GOP is more farther along in understanding that parts of it are further along in understanding that than Democrats who are victim to it rather than understand it. Like oh, they're, they're like uh, again. Why do you care about crime? Is the most class. You, you can't make a mistake like that without being several classes higher than the median voter. Yes. Uh, and by class, I mean, you don't experience crime. Uh, I'm looking yep. at this poll that just came out. A percentage of registered voters who see cr- violent crime as a very important voting issue this year. Black Democrats, 82%. White Democrats, 33%. That's incredible. Jesus Christ. What I mean, I, I think that that kind of data is more reliable than who are you going to vote for? Oh, absolutely. I because that tells me so much more. Of like, if eighty-two percent of Black Democrats think crime is a very serious issue, they are not voting for Kathy Hochul. No, like, it doesn't mean they're going to vote for Republican. But all they have to do is it stay means home. they may not vote at all. Let nature take its course. <laughs> you know, like I cannot do it, but I will allow those who can to do it. <laughs> you know, that's how Biden's in office. It was a bunch of Republicans voted for Republicans in Congress and just left the top of the ticket blank. Yeah, yeah, or or purposely did vote for him. I think I think that was very that was a very common thing to do in some, particularly in states where. It's it would normally be competitive, and it wasn't. Mm-hmm. Michigan wasn't that close. I think there was a lot of people who who did that, who pulled that move. Yeah, it's it's weird to me that Michigan wasn't close. Like it, it feels like a purple state now, but that I might just be overreading. Specifically, twenty sixteen. I am deeply looking forward to no longer needing to speculate and knowing. Yeah. Um, as far as election news goes, the other thing that I, I'm noticing is that the media blame has already started. Which, yes. Which was, I was not expecting that actually because of how good their message discipline had been up to this point to never fire upon the, the, the their own ships. But they have abandoned this and they have abandoned it very quickly here at the end. Because I don't think anyone wants to be the last person to uh, throw themselves uh, onto a hot take that's going to protect them from recriminations, you know? Vibes. <laughs> uh, it was so the first one that did it was Eric Wimpole at the Washington Post. Okay. I did not who, see this. Who wrote a column this past weekend that said that. Uh, James Bennett at the New York Times shouldn't have been fired for publishing the Tom Cotton op-ed. And the woke mob that made that decision happen was wrong. They should have been stopped. And he, Eric Wimple, admitted to his own cowardice in being afraid of saying that at the time. Because everyone was in this mood and mode to cancel anyone who said a word. And so he was a coward, like a lot of people who feel the way that he did at the time. And this this is him making amends to say, I was a coward and I should have said something then. And we're all about to suffer the consequences of the of us not was the subtext, right? Like right. I'm getting this take out there now because in a couple of weeks, when we lose worse than we had ever imagined. I want to be the first one to say whose fault it fucking was, <laughs> you know? And there, there was another one of these today. Yeah. New York magazine. Yes. The, the progressive less needs glass nosed, I think was the yeah. title of the piece. <laughs> it's a hell of a title. <laughs> yeah. Like they're, they're starting to 
prepare the way for who's going to get blamed. And this, this this was clear in 2020. Like there was that, there was that call with a bunch of, you know, uh, representatives in squishy seats who had said this defund the police woke stuff is killing us. We can't, we can't handle it. But the electoral loss wasn't bad enough because they still won the presidency at the end of the day. Mm-hmm. That it it didn't give them permission to kind of and they got the break Senate. free. Yeah, like they won the Senate, they lost House seats. They won the Senate because of 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 Trump's you know inability to get past his ego too. Like they didn't even expect to win that, but they did on accident. But that was a month after. Like there was a, there was a solid gap between the phone call and yeah, the Abigail Spanberger thing where she she like leaked it where she's like yeah. I fucking told them. That yeah. this was what happened, and this is why we got fucking butchered, and why we have a six seat majority now. And like you said, because so much else went their way, it covered it up, and that influence only grew from from that point. Because now they're in power, you know. Now they're enjoying the fruits of control of the presidential administration, and shit is gets keeps getting pushed and keeps accelerating, and it's getting so far over the skis of the folks who are trying to, to, to stop them that it's, it's almost too late once it started. Like it does not escape anyone that the, the Biden administration appointed like out and out sex weirdos to the cabinet and undersecretary positions. Like the, the trans secretary of health from Pennsylvania you made an undersecretary of health. You you have made your statement. Yeah, like that's what you've done. That is a that is a political statement of how far gone you are in of itself. You know, <laughs> there it is. You've communicated a lot in a very little, and like you've already made that choice. What I mean, everything else is too is it's already too late. Yep. You've already made the mistake. So given that this is uh, technically an election preview podcast, I feel like we should cover some individual races. We talked about this before, but uh, I don't know if that's going to air before the midterms. But uh, we think J.D. Vance is going to win. So I'll very confidently state that J.D. Vance is going to win. Because about 800 hojillion people are going to show up to vote for Mike DeWine. Yep. And... If you want a classic case of someone's coattails are just going to be so big, it, you can't lose. I think it's JD Vance. I, there, there's going to be a lot of people who are very satisfied with a Republican governor who may not like Vance, but they also don't trust Democrats and are going to check the box. So if DeWine wins by 16, do I expect Vance to win much more by five than by five? No, <laughs> but. It's going to be too much that Mike DeWine wins by for Vance not to win. And there have been enough signs of panic from inside the Tim Ryan campaign that it, it seems like they know. Yeah, like it might not be close when the bell rings, you know, like it might be nine points and they kind of know that. Or it might be two, but it, it yeah, wide margin for error, but Vance probably wins. Yeah, and you can tell that by the, pro, you know, it the revealed preference or GTFO. No, there's been no outside money that's coming to the race. There's been no of the money from the, from the, the main organs of getting senators elected have come into this race. With thanks to Stacey Abrams. So what other predictions do you want to make? Uh, New Hampshire, obviously still lean Dem or better, but you want to put any numbers on, an upset there? No, I actually don't think that. I think Maggie Hassan can win because Don Bulldog's kind of crazy. I think that, you know, I'm not really willing necessarily to put a flyer out there on any of these kind of like out there, like seats of like deep blue territory, except for one. Uh, I do think actually in Oregon, you could have an upset. They've had a lot of problems. Portland's been a crime infested hellhole for the last two years, a lot of people have moved away. There's a lot of dissection about people who people who have remained and their current governor is term limited. Kate Brown. She can no longer run. 
And her handpicked successor is running against a Republican and an independent who's also a Democrat, who's further to the left. Okay. And the race has, it's first past the post. There's no runoff. So whoever has the most votes at the end of the day wins. You can win with 34%. Oh. Yeah. And this Republican has been consistently pulling two or three points ahead for the last two weeks in that race because of the the unique circumstances. And I can easily see, because Oregon's rural population is very underrated. You never hear about it. You never see it. But it's very politically connected and well-organized mm-hmm. because they're they're they feel so unrepresented in their state. And I could easily see them overwhelming a very dispossessed, angry, upset at the status quo urban core around Portland who doesn't like what's happened as a consequence of progressive governance. So there, there I do think that a red governor could show up in the middle of fucking nowhere, <laughs> out of nowhere, like off the top rope, laying down the people's elbow. <laughs> and, and the and circumstances the, seem perfect for it. What's the, what's the red governor like? Um, uh, looking this guy up. I know nothing about the candidates, to be honest with you, aside from the fact that the established Democrat in the race is the current, uh, governor's handpicked successor, Tina Cody, and no one likes her. <laughs> um, Christine Drazen, and it's all women. And Betty Johnson is the name of the independent. So I know nothing about Christine Drazen, but I think generic R might actually be good enough <laughs> in Oregon this year. I don't think it matters. Wild. How about you? Any more guesses before we we let let the fickle gods of democracy tell us what the future holds for us? I think Oz wins. I know that's uh, maybe a little too vibesy. Um, that the vibes are real bad for uh, I don't for think John Fetterman right now. I, I think if if this is the vibes election has a thesis statement, it is Oz versus Fetterman. Yeah, yeah. You know, just, if it's a vibes I, 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 election, I, I, Oz wins. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like because the polls have them very close, if not Oz, just a little bit behind. But uh, wow, are the vibes for Fetterman real bad, uh, and appropriately so. Uh, it uh, brings me no pleasure to see what is happening to him. Obviously it's, uh, it's sad to see him going through a very difficult personal health event like that, but it w- it was really painful to watch that debate. It, it, somebody should have stopped him. He's, he's definitely at the point where people who love him have to step in, even if, he doesn't if he even if he wants to go out and debate even if he thinks he can people who love him should have stepped in and, and, and he had a cnn hit this morning that was just as painful like he's it was awful won. yeah and you you just said it's someone who loves him needs to stop him i hope that like he's not being pushed you know that's like my fear i don't know the man i'm sure he wants it you know right? so i don't want to discount that this is stubborn pride more than anything else i get it no one runs for Senate because they're a, a wilting violet, you know, like they got to want it. But uh, I genuinely do hope this is just his stubborn pride and not someone who is manipulating him or forcing him to do something he doesn't want to do. Absolutely. Um, uh, but yeah, if, if elections are vibes as has any truth to it, Oz wins by, and it's not close. I, you would hope that that's what ends up happening, but we'll, we'll find out. Also, I do think we will finally see the end of Stacey Abrams' political career. Oh, uh, yeah, she's done. Yeah. like She's, she's, she's so toast. She was uh, spending several minutes defending late-term abortions in their second debate, and you saw no clips from it for a reason. You know, like, it was not good. It wasn't a good sight. You saw it the was a- CNN clip. Was it CNN where she said that inflation is high because women can't abort babies, and that means that the they're spending more on child care? Yeah. That's, yeah, that was her. That's not good. She, that that's not gonna that's not gonna work in the Bible Belt. Promise. You know, I know that like Georgia is more purple these days, but Georgia is still in the South. Yeah, <laughs> like you can't, you can't, you can't transgress too hard, you know, or or this is what's gonna gonna happen. So, and it almost doesn't matter. Like Kemp is popular in his own right. Yeah, and it really showed that if you have 
enough backbone you can resist Trump, which is like the real reason I like him. Like he called Trump on his bullshit the whole way down and never backed away and never hemmed and hawed and never ran from the fight later. He like went at it with hurricane force. The moment it showed up, it was like meet strength with strength. Let's do it. And won very I'll easily. S- I will sit in this room with my lawyer and we will talk to you for as long as it takes. And my lawyer will be present and we'll make sure that your uh, not so veiled threats about the department of justice. Don't go anywhere because you know, the classic once anyone se- suggests bringing in the lawyers, we're, we're done being cordial. <laughs> yeah. No, we the stakes of this conversation have become clear by, by uh, implication. <laughs> yep. Uh, Herschel there was Walker a- still a toss up. Yeah. Like I think Herschel Walker might just lose cause he's just not electable. Like, yep. You know, like that might be the, the one that no vibes can save. The vibes for Herschel Walker are really bad. I think that McConnell was happy to give that seat away. And it like, I think that he knew he had to give one up to Trump's ego. And he, that was the one he's like, fine, I'm not going to fight this one. I don't think he wanted Blake masters. I think he's learned to accept that he would, he can make do with him, but I don't think he's like crying any tears over, over Herschel Walker not being his problem in a few months, you know? Like, oh, good. <laughs> That's just going to be over. That's excellent. I, I can live with that. But, I, I still get majority leader, and I don't have Herschel Walker, so McConnell wins on all counts, as usual. The man's undefeated. <laughs> like, I can deal with this Peter Thiel, you know, wannabe guy. <laughs> like, because it turns out all his friends didn't help him. That's that was the end there in the end in that race. That's why I thought that was very interesting how the internal politics played out with Blake Masters. Is oh, I thought you were talking about JD Vance. No, so like Vance got money a lot earlier because like like I I told you before Vance is a company man through and through. He's just put on such a good show for Trump and he right. fed his ego in a perfect way that a that a Hawkeye you know lawyer would figure out <laughs> that that's why he got it. But they didn't want Masters. And they left him out hanging out to dry and said, Peter Thiel, if you want this fucking guy to win, you can put your money in. Donald Trump, if you want to get this guy to win, you can put your money in. We're not touching it. We're not touching this race. This is your fucking problem. And for months, they let that one go. And they're like, fine, I guess we'll lose Arizona too, right? But a weird thing happened. Kerry Lake turned out to be a great candidate. <laughs> Carrie Lake was on television for 20 years and she knows how to embarrass people on camera to make them look stupid and unprepared and make her look like a genius. I did not expect her to be as good as she is, but it turns out she's very good. And she turned that race around all on her own because her opponent in that race is an all time terrible candidate, bad at talking and refused to debate out of fear. (laughs) Like, so when all of that happens and the Arizona governor race started to have some some tailwinds and it looked like Kerry Lake was going to very clearly start to get ahead, that opens you up that this this Democrat seat, uh, Senate seat, suddenly there's coattails. Okay. Tell you what, Blake, none of your friends came to give you money. But what if I give you money? If you're cocaine Mitch. What if I step in with the NRCC and I give do some ad buys, and I make sing I, I make some things happen for you. Are you a good boy? Are you a good boy for Cocaine Mitch? Is that what's <laughs> going to happen? Because I think you're going to be a good boy for Cocaine Mitch if I am the one that paves your way, right? Mm-hmm. And then he took that deal. <laughs> like that's that's what happened. And then suddenly the ad buys started. Peter Thiel got in the race like late for very little to kind of try and save face. Trump, obviously, he's just going to sit on all of his fucking dragon gold. He ain't going to spend it for anybody. Um, I, actually, he did spend for Oz, of all people. Did he really? Saw, yeah, like right after the debate, he cut this ad making fun of John Fetterman for having a stroke. <laughs> oh, jeez. That's the most Trumpy thing I've ever heard. He spent like a million dollars on it, too. Like, he really, he really, like, like, because he made fun of Biden and Fetterman for being basically too impaired to be in office. You know, it's like at, perfect, right? It's like, but he spent money for Oz, and it's because Oz is his personal friend, because they're TV guys. And then they, they, they vibe. 
Yeah. There you go. Vibes. Bring the vibes all the way back to Trump. Trump vibes with Oz. That's why he wanted him to run. It's why he backed him. It's why he does rallies for him. It's why he puts money in his campaign because he vibes with Oz. He doesn't really care about Blake Masters except that Cocaine Mitch didn't want him. You know, in Herschel Walker was basically like the the you know someone he knew from his sports days. It's like that 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 uh, touring act that your dad really likes and he's got all the albums, but like hasn't been relevant in 30 years. That's Herschel Walker, right? Like that's who that was. He's like, he just thought it would be cool for him to run for Senate. And it turns out he's a garbage fire. Right. <laughs> he's like, ah, <laughs> shockingly the football players as moral heroes. Not, not, not great. Don't do that. Bad idea. <laughs> oh, you know, and there's another political obituary we're going to get to write on Tuesday that I'm deeply looking forward to. Beto O'Rourke. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. Right. The I, class of 2018 Democratic bench is about to have a real bad fucking time. <laughs> You're going to get roasted. Oh, especially if Gretchen Whitmer loses. Oh. That's that's the end of their bench. But uh, Beto O'Rourke, man, it was 2018 where he ran against uh, Ted Cruz. And made it a real close run thing. Yep. It was, it was, um, and and this man is going to wind up losing three elections. And that's how he got famous. <laughs> like lost against lost against Ted Cruz decided to run for president, which was like, are you serious? <laughs> like, are you serious about that? Okay. Sure. I guess. Right. Can't you let, let's go for it. If Tulsi Gabbard's doing it. I guess you can too, buddy. And, and then he goes to say, oh, there's room on the left for me to run to by being explicitly anti-gun and anti-church. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to get all the the fucking edgy 42-year-old Gen X guys. You know, that that's who I'm going to go for. And found out that there's none, there, none of those people exist. It's just him. <laughs> it's just him. And I, I, you know, after fumbling that as badly as he did, to have the temerity to think I'm going to run for governor of Texas. And the fact that I, there's tape of me talking about, Oh, we need to tax churches and take AR 15s. I'm just going to win. I have a act for an actual shot at this, you know? Yeah. Like, what? Yeah. I forgot that he was running. Honestly, like Beto, Beto is kill. Um, most famous for being outed as a furry due to running for office. It's a, it's a very online joke. I'm sorry if you get that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, w- another race that I mentioned uh, at the top was the mayor of LA. You uh, you seen any of the chatter about this? I have not. Fill me in. Do you know who Chank Uger is? No. Oh, you'll have a blessed existence, my friend. Chank Uger is the primary host of a uh, groundbreaking online show called the young Turks. Oh, the young, the young Turks guy. Yes. Okay. That is, so you, that is not how I thought his name was pronounced. That, oh, okay. That, okay. So you that, do know who Cenk Uger is. You just didn't know that's yes. how his name was. It's okay. a classic. I have only read this word. I've never heard this yeah. said out loud. Yeah. Cause it, it wouldn't surprise me if you didn't know, because Cenk Uger was from jet was like first wave YouTuber. Right. Like he, he goes he, way back. He goes. Yeah. He does go way back. Like he was on air America. You know, he was a lawyer. He's like a little older than me. Even he's in his forties. And he was he, the Young Turks took off because he just realized the YouTube was like this gateway to a huge audience that he could right. cultivate because no one else was there. You know, the algorithm will promote you if you if you get people this, to sit there for ten minutes. Yeah, it was even promoted. like pre-algorithm. It was just by word of mouth and like easy access to the audience, and there just wasn't much content. You know, I, I'm sorry. What, you just said pre-algorithm. What does that mean? <laughs> I know that it's. <laughs> It's weird to consider social media that's not algorithmically driven, but like pre-2015, pre-2012 probably, it was very not algorithmically generated. It was, it was, you had to know what you were looking for and you had to like self-select into interests or the machine wouldn't know what to suggest to you. Wow. Know. Yeah. Like you, the, the, these machines were specifically designed so that everything was opt-in. Because they respected your privacy. 
And if you didn't but, want to provide them with information, you just wanted to access the service, then of course you may be permitted to do that. Your information is just so that you'll, you know, to drive your user experience, not because we want to harvest your data. They didn't realize until much later that that was the most profitable part of their business. But then, <laughs> then what if you like, you go and you see the thing that you wanted to see and you actively looked up and then you stop look like, what if you don't want to see anything else? Yeah, so so in 2012, you would log <laughs> off. Have you ever heard of logging off? No, no, I have not. Is that when you switch accounts to, to uh, go no. to a different account? No, you may have heard of it uh, under the phrase touched grass. But, oh. But unironically, like you would oh. actually leave your house. Oh, I, I this is all very The internet on your me. phone was bad, and you didn't like use it all the time. You know, like... <laughs> Like, because it was a new thing. Like, it was not something you're used to having. And and people lived like this on they, purpose. They they made it somehow. <laughs> I mean, it, it's funny to you talk. Like, I know we're a little off the rails of the election now, but this is an interesting topic. Just that people talk about like, oh, back in the day when I worked in the video store or whatever, the blockbuster in the '90s, wasn't it so like strange that you used to get like. D- physical media to watch a movie and people would talk about things and have shared experiences and like connection was something you did personally and like calling someone was something you would do very commonly to communicate with them, blah, blah, blah. Right. Like that's super boomer stuff now. Oh, it is. I, you know, I, this is all like, I, I remember some of this, but only vaguely. Right. Like people, people like me talking about growing up in that kind of environment is already overplayed. Right. Yeah. I remember using the yellow pages more than once, but less than 20 times. God, you find new ways to wound me. So <laughs> what I think is even more interesting than that, that sort of overplayed boomerism is just the changes over the last 10 years. Okay. From 2012 to 2022, like 2012 was the dawn of the common smartphone era. I want to call it. Mm-hmm. Where you you started to have iPhones and then everything else kind of congealed around around um, Android phones because that was the, the, that that second competitor was a little slow to crystallize. You had kind of smartphone imitators that were each being made by each different company, and they they weren't nearly as coherent as they became under like Samsung and that sort of thing down the line, and became very similar experiences. I'm really curious to see how this circles back to Sank. Well, it, it would it was Chank was because of the they were they were first run YouTubers yeah, before there was right, uh, right. Yeah, the before there was algorithms. So we've abandoned the election. I I think Karen Bass is going to lose his LA mayor. There, done. I think the oh, okay. former Republican is going to win because he's promising to throw the homeless out. <laughs> <laughs> like that is again vibes, right? Like, Wait, do no, you live in LA? Is it a shithole? Do you vote? You're not voting for Karen Bass. All right. <laughs> but and and Chank even, Uger, even famous Chank Uger. yeah, and famous progressive Chank Uger came out and out and said, "I'm not voting for Karen Bass. I'm voting for the Republican." And it's because this city is a mess. There's too much crime and there's homeless everywhere. Like you, you reveal preference or GTFO, my friends. Like, there it is. <laughs> there it is. I don't want to live in a crime infested city anymore. I'm going to vote for a fucking fire eating Republican who are going to arm men to bring order and justice. There it is. Even Shank Uger will admit it. <laughs> like, and then in 30 years, they'll go crazy and have leaking hair dye. Oh, wait, no. In terms of 2012 to 2022 technology, the big change that happened was algorithmically driven content machines. As technology improved such that people could be on their phones more. People were on their phones, but it, like it was a slower connection. It was 3G. 4G didn't even exist yet. So everything had to be very simple. Like the smartphone was still seen as pretty amazing technology, full browsers with video support. It was like, we're starting to be developed around then. And very battery intensive. So and yeah, you couldn't necessarily use them for super long because you would drain the battery because battery technology hadn't caught up yet. So you couldn't necessarily keep people addicted in the same way. Um, that you could as technology improved. And once that technology improved and people were able to just be on their phones all day and not kill it and that the phone experience was 
getting better and better with each new technological iteration, suddenly my machine learning can make it so that I can give you enough to interact with enough to do that you're going to stay on the app, on the, on the device, and you won't be able to break the doom loop. And that was just in the last 10 years. And that even that 10 year period is kind of like, that's almost nostalgic for you. Like that was right at the beginning of your adulthood that, that this was change started, you know, and now here in your mid twenties, you, you're like, Oh, (laughs) would you look at that? There was a world before. Anyway, thanks for listening to replacement level morality. Hopefully our takes aren't ice cold by the time you listen to this. But if they are, we'll see you next week with something a little fresh, warm, delightful for the senses. Maybe fewer vibes. Maybe. <laughs>